Comey was spying on Trump. Well, the reason he was writing the memos was to create a record so that he could destroy No them. American knowingly colluded with the Russians to interfere in our election campaign. Oh wait, unless you mean Hillary Clinton. Pardons, prosecutions, and transparency. Hey everyone, Judicial Watch President Tom Fitton here with the latest Judicial Watch weekly update on social media. Thanks for joining us. Uh, a busy, busy week. I don't know if I even have enough time to talk about everything Judicial Watch has been doing to support the rule of law, defend the Constitution, and uncover government corruption. But I'll try. A lot going on. It's Independence Day weekend this weekend. I wish you and yours a uh, glorious and safe Independence Day as we celebrate the founding of our nation, uh, which is under under fundamental attack uh, from the communist revolutionaries trying to overthrow our republic right now as we speak. Um, I've got a special treat for you in that regard. Uh, plus, uh, Judicial Watch has uh, a new lawsuit for documents about Joe Biden, a new lawsuit for documents about the unmaskings, and uh, as I was suggesting earlier, a new lawsuit trying to hold a leftist uh, government here accountable to the rule of law on its First Amendment violations of Judicial Watch's rights tied to the protests. So I'll talk about that as well. So a lot going on. First up, uh, though, is uh, our big new lawsuit uh, against the University of Delaware over its failure to turn over Biden documents from his time in the Senate to the American people. And specifically, Judicial Watch has filed a lawsuit in the state of Delaware on behalf of itself and our friends at the Daily Caller News Foundation. Now, we had asked for the records, um, well, not way back when, but earlier this year, uh, back in April 30th of 2020, uh, we had filed a FOIA request for documents about what, uh, how this university was handling the Joe Biden documents. We want communications the university had with Senator Biden, or excuse me, Vice President Biden about the records and maybe even Senator Biden, who knows? And uh, especially about the issue about the proposed release of records and how that was going to be handled. Our friends at the Daily Caller News Foundation asked for all the records. Where are all these records that this a uh, state-supported institution has about Joe Biden's time as a senator. You know, what's interesting about this case is that as a senator, you know, typically these records are hard to get uh, because Congress, as you know, exempts itself. Maybe you don't know this, but you will be outraged to learn, perhaps, that Congress exempts itself from the Freedom of Information Act and other general records laws like that. Uh, but in turning these records over to the state's supported institution that is covered by the Freedom of Information Act, Senator Biden has made his records subject to public scrutiny. And so any agreements, side agreements, allegedly they have, when in this case, the side agreement is to, um, they won't, yeah, they wouldn't be released until he, he uh, leaves office or, or, uh, basically doesn't, uh, let me see, let me get the uh, specific thing. Oh, excuse me. The university has said it will not release the records until two years after Biden has retired from public life. So when did he end, when did he stop being a senator? In, 19, in 2000, 2004? So President Trump, President Obama ran in 2008. So 2007, 2008, it's now 2020. Now Biden doesn't want any, let's say he wins in November. And then he wins again the next November. 2028. So decades will pass before we be able to look at the, the senator's Again, public records that are being maintained with taxpayer dollars, that can't be the case. So accordingly, we sued. You know, they denied our request. They claimed without cooperation, this University of Delaware, that public funds are not used to support 
uh, the Biden general, the Biden center's um, senatorial papers. So why was it, why is it we want these documents? A, in many ways, because they're there, because these are documents that ought to be disclosed to the American people under law. And of course, there are all these controversies. You had this Tara Reid, who accused Biden of sexually assaulting her. She suggested that records about her complaints around the assault would be in his senatorial papers. And of course, Biden himself has admitted to communicating with Vladimir Putin and other foreign leaders when he was a senator. So what was he talking to Putin about? I mean, isn't that interesting to anybody? He's running for president. It doesn't mean that there will be scandalous records. Maybe Tara Reid will be shown to be having um, not told the truth. Maybe his communications with Vladimir Putin and other foreign leaders make him seem like a great man. Well, if so, why are they hiding the records? That's my question. So when you hide material, in many cases, not all the time, in many cases it's because you have something to hide, especially if the reason for hiding is really not lawful. And in the case of the University of Delaware, it's Delaware, the Senator Biden, Vice President Biden is a giant political figure there. When he was a senator for years and years and years, he was vice president. I'm sure he's a favorite son. So we, you know, we can't let politics get in the way, though, in the enforcement of the rule of law. And so everyone's, you know, what's incredible about this is that this man is running for president of the United States. And who is first to try to ask basic questions in court about what he did as a senator? Judicial Watch. I mean, he's been running, what, for a year now? And we're the only ones in court with, of course, our friends at Daily Caller News Foundation. And I'm sure other news organizations have asked for the records, but no one sued. Again, it's Judicial Watch doing the basic heavy lifting for government accountability and just, just the rule of law and transparency issues. And uh, again, you know, we've got all of these issues about Joe Biden uh, uh, as a senator but the sexual harassment complaint, Vladimir Putin, his handling of Supreme Court nominations. I mean, that's a big deal too. Remember he ran the Thomas nomination? I mean, that was a wild abuse of, of Justice Thomas at the time. I'd like more information about that more, uh, in particular as well. And so the University of Delaware should stop protecting Joe Biden and release the records. And of course, the vice president he can just authorize the release of these records as well. There's nothing preventing him. Let's, let's presume that there's this agreement. And let's presume that it, uh, it has any validity under law. I don't think it does. He can just authorize the release of the records. Two years after he retires, you know, effectively, that means we'll never see them. Or we'll see them at a point in time when it won't have any impact on our decision making related to our government. So that's why Judicial Watch is in court right now in the state of Delaware on behalf of Judicial Watch, obviously, and the Daily Caller News Foundation to find out the full truth about Senator Biden's record as a United States Senator. And uh, it's just remarkable that we're the ones doing it uh, and no one else is. But, you know, that's Judicial Watch. It's, that's welcome to our lives. This is what happens where we kind of end up doing the basic work that you would think the media would be doing, Congress would be doing, and others might be doing. But obviously, it's, uh, that's why it's such a wonderful thing that the law allows us to be able to do this work, uh, because in any other country, we don't, there, many, most other countries don't have laws like this allowing access to the records. They just don't. And if they are, they're much more draconian in terms of uh, being in favor of the government versus the people. And here we have this government accountability law uh, that allows us to petition our government and hold it accountable as the Constitution provided for. And by darn it, uh, you know, we're, we're going to use it to the hilt. We're going to use it to the hilt. 
because our freedoms are at stake every day, every day, no matter who's in power, our freedoms are at stake from an overreading, abusive government. And the only way to keep that in check is to have accountable government. I shouldn't say the only way, but it's a, it's a key way. So with that, we're going to be in court. I'll let you know what happens. And I hope Joe Biden joins us in uh, our calls for transparency under law here. But we all know how that's going to work out. Next up is um, a major lawsuit um, about another some, something else that ties to Joe Biden, although it really isn't focused necessarily on Mr. Biden. It's about this unmaskings issue. Now, remember Samantha Power, the United Nations ambassador for uh, the United States under President Obama? She reportedly had 260 unmaskings of American citizens, which is highly unusual. Most senior officials rarely, if ever, unmask anybody in their capacities as senior foreign intelligence, uh, as senior officials that have top secret or secret clearance, national security clearances, and receive intelligence. And unmasking typically is uh, someone's Ameri an American name is picked up in the spy operations the U.S. conducts abroad or of foreign nationals. So let's say in let's say uh, KGB officer X is talking to KGB officer Y. I know the KGB doesn't exist, but bear with me. And they mention, hey, we have so and so on the take. That's when someone's name might be unmasked if so and so is an American citizen. Well, in the case of General Flynn, they were unmasking him. The vice president was Biden. Uh, Samantha Power was, Obama's chief of staff was, obviously on behalf of the president, and a whole host of everyone at the top levels of the Trump uh, Obama administration. They were unmasking him just because they were trying to figure out ways to undermine the Trump administration. So that was necessarily an abuse of power, maybe a violation of law. And Power's testimony on this issue has kind of been all over the place. Uh, she. Um, I just, uh, we just filed, we just put out our release on it today. So in 2017, it reported, uh, it was reported that Power had asked a mass 260 persons. She was unmasking at such a rapid rate in the final months of the Obama administration that she averaged more than one request for every working day in 2016, even seeking information in the days leading up to President Trump's inauguration. I bet you that was tied to Flynn. And, and, you know, the whole Russiagate smear operation. She said, though, that her, the unmaskings were under her name, but she didn't ask for them. Now, I don't know how that works. It doesn't sound right to me, but that's what she testified. I did not make those requests. Is that going to be Biden's excuse for his unmasking of General Flynn? He didn't make the request. Someone made it in his name. I don't know. Is anyone going to ask him the question? Is Durham going to ask him the question? You know, and Power was an anti-Trumper, so let's be clear here. It wasn't politically speaking; she wasn't one of these career bureaucrats who just made it as the UN ambassador, and she was doing her duties under the U.S. Constitution, which, which I, you know, I don't necessarily think she wasn't. But she was a political operative, a political appointee of President Obama. And she obviously had, because her email traffic demonstrates that, uh, a political animus to President Trump, the incoming president. Now, we had asked for documents about Samantha Power's unmaskings and back when they first came out in 2018. We had sued in two that we had asked beginning in 2017. We sued in 2018 and we didn't get anywhere. You know why? Because this administration, State Department, told us they gave us what is called a Glomar response, which is named after a, um, a ship. I don't know if it was our ship or the Russian ship. I forget. Well, anyway, we were doing a, um, we were trying to figure out. Uh, whether, uh, I guess, a sub had sunk or there's been something related to the Russians. 
and we're doing a deep sea expedition to figure out, see what we could get. Someone had asked questions about it, and I think the ship was the USS Glomar or something like that, the Glomar Explorer, maybe. And uh, the response from the agency was, CIA was, we can't confirm or deny. And you can just imagine on national security re issues why it is an agency might say, we can't confirm or deny what it is we have or don't have. You know, they often give us that uh, that answer in response to uh, a request about like, uh, like to protect the identities of CIA employees. We don't confirm or deny who works or doesn't work for us. Uh, we um, you, you want to make you don't want to give the other side any information that could harm our national security. And so the law allows uh, under court rulings, the law allows that type of response in certain national security situations. That's the response they gave us to the unmaskings. They couldn't even confirm or deny if she asked for anything to be unmasked. So it was an over-the-top uh, uh, assertion of the uh, I can't confirm or deny. Unfortunately, the court upheld it, so you know the case ended. Well, thankfully, the Office of Director of National Intelligence released the list of those who requested unmaskings of General Flynn. Samantha Power was on that list. As a result, they no longer had the excuse the deep state does to deny our request as we can't confirm or deny. So we refiled our request. They ignored us again. So we sued. We sued in federal court. I mean, don't you love Judicial Watch? I mean, we're told no. We go to court. The court says no. Circumstances change, we ask again, and then we go to court again on the same issue. Why? Because it's, a, it's the worst corruption scandal in American history. Everyone else wants to just pretend it didn't happen or cover it up. But I don't know about you, but I want as much accountability as possible for that terrible corruption that saw all our intelligence agencies being used for political purposes to improperly spy on American citizens, namely the incoming president of the United States. And in the case of these unmaskings, it was part of a, in my view, it was in part of a seditious conspiracy against the incoming president to undermine his ability to do his job, targeting Flynn and things like that. So our request, you're gonna like our request. All requests for information submitted to any intelligence community member agency by former United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, concerning any actual or suspected effort by the Russian government or any individual acting on behalf of the Russian government to influence the 2016 presidential election, the alleged hacking of computer systems utilized by the Democratic National Committee and or the Clinton presidential campaign, any actual suspected communication between any member of the Trump presidential campaign or transition team and any official or employee of the Russian government or individual acting on behalf of the Russian government. The identities of U.S. citizens associated with the Trump presidential campaign or transition team who are identified pursuant to intelligence collection activities all records or responses received by former United States Ambassador to the United Nations, Samantha Power, uh, or a representative um, re in response to her requests. On the various topics. So we want it all. We want to know what she asked for and what she got. You know, and as I say in the release, the entire world now knows let me read my quote. It's a good quote. Oftentimes I put these uh, quotes in our press releases and I forget about them and I look at them and I say, well, that's a great quote. I agree with me. And here it is. The entire world now knows the Obama administration went on an unprecedented fishing expedition, which involved unmasking General Flynn, but almost certainly others tied to the Trump campaign, including the president and his family. You may have seen the reports that they think his family was unmasked as well. They were spying on his family. So when you hear unmasking, substitute the word spying. Unmasking means they were spying on a foreigner and now they were, and through that, they were able to pick up information on an American citizen. So they're using that spying activity to get information on an American citizen. 
Unmasking is spying. The president of the United States, Trump's team, was spied upon in, in um, massive ways by the Obama administration. 260 requests. 260 requests just from one official. And for almost three years, the State Department has been stonewalling our request for information on this basic Obama gate information. And we hope the court tears down this stone wall. As I say, around the worst corruption scandal in American history. Now, remember that unmasking material that was released by the ODNI. I forget if that was uh, Rich Grinnell or the new director, uh, John Ratcliffe, who released it. Either way, they both deserve credit because they began the, the kind of the process to uncover this material or at least partially uncover it. It was only partially. It was only partial because we don't have everything they were unmasking. We need everything. I mean, even this lawsuit is partial in terms of what it's asking for because we're just asking for what Samantha Power was looking for. I suppose we could do the same with the CIA, with Brennan. I suppose we could do the same with Clapper, who is the head of the uh, Office of Director of National Intelligence under Obama. Kerry, did Kerry do unmaskings? I think so. State Department head under Obama. Who wasn't unmasking? More importantly, who wasn't the target of the spying within the Trump campaign? Because you can bet, as I said, Trump, General Flynn, his family, Lord knows who else. So once again, judicial watch to the rescue to figure out the truth, the full truth about the Obama Gate scandal. So um, oh, I, I forgot about this. She testified under oath. She had no memory of asking about Flynn in the unmaskings. Hmm. Well, that's why it's important we get the full truth out. So I want to talk about abortion. Because there's this, uh, there was another rogue Supreme Court ruling this week. We had filed. There's this law in Louisiana that essentially required that abortion doctors have admitting privileges in local hospitals. It's a rule that generally applies to anyone conducting outpatient services like abortion doctors do. But because it's about abortion, the rule of law and the rules evidently don't apply. The law was challenged. The regulations were challenged. Uh, the pushback from the abortion industry was, uh, you know, we'll have to shut down clinics. Women won't be able to get abortions the way they might otherwise be able to. Ignored, of course, was that the law was designed to actually protect their patients, which, again, made it curious as a matter of law. And this is what we filed an amicus brief on when it went before the Supreme Court, how it is the abortion industry could go in and defend a right on behalf of a third party with which it had potentially an adversarial relationship. Because it's obviously in the interest, because costs and otherwise, of the abortion industry in terms of not to be regulated, which could be contrary to the interests of their patients who want safer procedures. How, you know, however ironic they use the word safe is related to abortion. So it went up to the court and um, four liberal justices, along with Chief Justice Roberts, overturned the law. What's interesting is they couldn't even defend the underlying abortion law of the Supreme Court initially defined in Roe versus Wade and then kind of semi basically redefined a bit in a subsequent decision called Casey. What's really disappointing and, and um, disheartening is to see uh, Chief Justice Roberts bend the law for political purposes here in issuing his decision. So as I said, they're giving the abortion industry a free pass 
on something logically they shouldn't get a free pass on. I mean, they were allowed to be in court when no one else would have been allowed to be in court, making an argument on behalf of someone they don't represent. I mean, that's kind of like a basic function of our of our courts is that they can only consider cases or controversies before them. And no woman was making the argument here. I thought, I thought that was where the abortion right attached to, to, to a woman seeking an abortion, not to an abortionist. So they turned the rule of law there to get this result on abortion. They effectively gave the, spe- the the abortion industry a special veto power over any regulation of the industry. And Chief Justice, Ro- Chief Justice Roberts said, well, he was doing this because he was concerned about this doctrine called stare decisis. Now, that's basically a fancy way of saying precedent. Well, the precedent he was trying to protect in the Supreme Court, and one understands why you don't want judges overturning a decision every time a new issue arises. You want some certainty with it in the law, right? But when a decision is wrong, you the law deserves no, uh, the decision deserves no deference. And it's fundamentally wrong, like the abortion law is that promulgated by the court. Because remember, The reason we have abortion on demand, again, abortion on demand through the entire nine months of pregnancy is because of the Supreme Court. You may think states have a right to do that, to regulate that procedure. No, not according to the Supreme Court. That states can begin to recognize the biological reality if there are two lies at issue when you discuss abortion, not according to the Supreme Court. I mean, practically speaking. So there was a similar type regulation, different case, but similar type regulation that uh, was overturned by the Supreme Court a few years ago that Judge Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, dissented on. And just a few years later, he says that case he disagreed with deserves precedential respect. You know, as Chief Justice, excuse me, as just, I wish you were Chief Justice, as Justice Thomas writes in his dissent, this is a great quote, I encourage you to read these Supreme Court decisions. I can't, I can't get into the detail with you. I could, I'd love to read them for you. Uh, but I don't think you want to sit here and let, listen to me read an entire Supreme Court dissent or decision or concurring opinion, however you may want it. But they're accessible to the layman. I'm not a lawyer. I read them. You know, you, you, when you read enough of them, you know what parts to skip over. Just go ahead and read them. And I encourage you to read this decision as well, especially Chief Justice's dissent, Chief, uh, excuse me, Justice Thomas's dissent. And he highlights. Today, a majority of the court perpetuates its ill-founded abortion jurisprudence by enjoining a perfectly legitimate state law and doing so without jurisdiction. Without jurisdiction. I mean, it's one thing, you know, I don't, I oppose abortion. I, both, it's a matter of law and morally. But what I really get upset about, and this is not about abortion, is the lawlessness associated with the protection of abortion. The rules don't apply. It gets special consideration from the courts that no other constitutional right gets. Without jurisdiction, meaning the people making the case that it be turned aside, this law, had no business being in the court. If that was the case, the court had no business making a decision. So we can talk about the attacks on the rule of law from demonstrators in the street and from politicians, but when you have five justices play this game, our courts can undermine the rule of law just as well. 
And as I said, the one silver lining is that no member of the Supreme Court was willing even to defend the underlying basis of the abortion right. They avoided that altogether because they know it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, I want you to remember what, who's involved in abortions mostly in the United States, Planned Parenthood, and what abortion entails. I talked to you last week about shocking documents we received from the FDA, talking about how they are buying fetal remains, fetal organs, and the demand was fresh, not frozen. We issued previously receipts for the organs of aborted unborn human beings. $600 for a liver there, $600 for a thymus there. We had uh, and this, um, let me see if I can, I pulled it up. Uh, one of the key groups that exposed this, this uh, fetal traffic, this, this organ trafficking. And in the cases we were uncovering, the, what, you know, what would they need the, the organs for? Humanized mice. So monstrosity on top of monstrosity. And the company providing this, they had a testimony on, on this because the Center for Medical Progress, which was highlighted these issues and exposed it, they were targeted for exposing this potentially illegal activity. The law doesn't allow selling these remains for profit. They released new deposition video. I'm going to quote from their release. This is, this is really terrible. So I, I'm warning you, you may want to just fast forward. The new video includes unsealed deposition testimony from Perrin Larton, the procurement manager of Advanced Bioscience Resources which harvests fetal organs and tissues inside Planned Parenthood clinics in Southern California and resells them to taxpayer-sponsored researchers across the country. Those are the sorts of documents that we uncovered, the, the transactions between uh, the NIH and FDA and these groups. Larton testified about the fetuses, ABR harvests, and this is the quote, they just sometimes they fell, they fall out of the abortion patient when the patient delivers the fetus entirely intact in the operating room once every few months, every couple months. Larton further testified that the fetus is still intact when she receives it in the clinic, laboratory, and nothing is done to the fetus by the abortion provider before providing it intact to Larton, at which point she testified that ABR will, quote, do a dissection to get the tissues the researchers have requested. I didn't see anything in the Supreme Court decision about that. When asked if the intact fetuses had just fall out in the operating room and had a heartbeat, Lawton testified, it would depend. I can see hearts that are not in an intact POC, product of conception. Excuse me, I can see hearts that are not in an intact POC that are beating independently after removal from the fetus. They're harvesting life, beating hearts. That's how I read it. And then they talk about harvesting non-viable Uh, take, uh, uh, products of conception. And what is the definition of non-viable? It means they don't want to save them. They're alive. I know they kept it warm and comfortable. This is one non-viable unborn human being, actually born, for the very brief period it was alive. I don't think there was even time to call 911. This is something that every OBGYN deals with on a rare occasion. It's their medical judgment what to do in that circumstance. 
So you remember that controversy of what happens to the survivors of abortion? Human beings who survive abortion, the targets, they're left to die. They're left to die. So this is the abortion law created by our Supreme Court. It's not moral, it's not constitutional, and it's uh, destroying humanity, our humanity. So we were honored to try to stand for the rule of law in the Supreme Court case. It didn't go our way, but you can bet the March for Life will continue, at least as far as Judicial Watch is concerned. And I know I speak for millions of pro-life Americans in that regard. So that's quite a topic to talk about. Uh, so I told you last, I guess three weeks ago now, uh, that um, here in the District of Columbia, in the face of civil insurrection by uh, groups associated with the radical Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the mayor of D.C. used tax dollars to paint Black Lives Matter on 16th Street, which is the street which runs right into the White House. So this is the White House right here, and this is 16th Street. There's a park here. That's Lafayette Park. 16th Street comes right in. And she painted, and, and Mayor Bowser, who's our mayor, she painted it in uh, letters that are streetwide. And then she allowed the Black Lives Matter movement to add the following language Black Lives Matter equals defund the police, right next to it. I think they re eventually erased that part, but Black Lives Matter is still there. And Judicial Watch asked for equal access under the First Amendment to the streets of DC. We wanted to paint a street near our office and near Capitol Hill with our motto, because no one is above the law. And needless to say, they gave us the bureaucratic runaround. We had multiple communications with DC, DC officials and we couldn't get anywhere. So today, I should say today, yesterday, I think it was yesterday. This week, how's that? It was yet. It was yet. Uh, it was yesterday. This uh, this video is airing on Friday, but I'm taping it on Thursday. Um, we sued in federal court, civil rights complaint, for violating our First Amendment rights. We wanted access in a timely way to the streets to put our own message out there. And uh, the D.C. government gave us the runaround. You know, they this is uh, they sent us to a they sent us to a pay. You know, they said here you can go to this web page, get a permit. There's no there was no availability for there was no permit that covered what we wanted to do. We made calls. We we're getting pushback from the people we were talking to in the D.C. government. Well, I never heard of a permit like that. Couldn't get anything. They all knew what we wanted to do. Certainly the mayor's office did. So that sign is still there on 16th Street. But Judicial Watch, and frankly anyone else who wants to have an expressive message on the street, can't get access. Obviously don't like our message, which as I say is timely and important because no one above is above the law, applies to looters, rioters, the police, the politicians, the citizens. And of course, it protects all of us too, doesn't it? That theme. So that when our rights are violated, the law is supposed to hold those who violate them accountable. And this is what we wrote in our complaint. The lawsuit alleges that D.C. officials denied timely equal access to Judicial Watch to paint its own expressive message and violated federal civil rights law in A, allowing district seats, streets to be used for the painting of expressive messages, which constitutes protected First Amendment activity, but denying plaintiff Judicial Watch the timely opportunity to paint its expressive message on a district street for reasons that are not narrowly drawn to achieve a compelling government interest. B, 
failing to provide a reasonable basis for denying plaintiff the timely opportunity to paint its expressive message on a di district street. C, favoring the expressive messages painted on 16th Street Northwest and or creating the appearance of endorsing those messages to the exclusion of our message on a related subject matter. And or D, failing to provide reasonable non-arbitrary processes and procedures for timely consideration of our requests to paint an expressive message on a district street. We're willing to be flexible. We would have moved it to a different street. If we needed to close a street, we were trying to figure out how to close a street. We were all ready to go. We would pay for the paint. We'd get the contractor, we'd do everything. I mean, I know when we first announced this, and God bless America, all, all, all many of you, uh, you were all saying, well, you're willing to come to D.C. and do the painting for us. We appreciate that. We appreciate that. And it shows you why it's important that we be able to get the access, because we speak for millions of people. And you may think Black Lives Matter is, is a phenomenal message, and I'm not, the, I'm not debating that issue right now, and we can debate that. But don't you see, my fellow conservative and liberal Americans, that when a government starts painting messages on the street, politically controversial messages, or just messages generally on a matter of politics, and they don't allow anyone else to paint in that forum, that that's a problem? Don't you understand that? I think you do. I think you do. My experience, most Americans understand lack of fair play. When something's not fair, it ain't fair. In this case, when it ain't fair, it ain't legal. So we're now in federal court and we'll see what happens. Now, of course, DC isn't the only one playing this game. In New York City, they're planning on painting Black Lives Matter in all five bureaus. They're targeting Trump uh, specifically, the mayor of, DC, uh, mayor of Man Manhattan, ironic, it's a kind of a Freudian slip, the mayor of New York uh, is uh, de Blasio, far leftist, targeting the uh, Trump Tower by playing, painting Black Lives Matter. We're planning to do that in front of Trump Tower, attacking the president, obviously. So we asked the mayor of New York for access as well. We just sent a letter. I signed it this week. They announced five locations in Manhattan and Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, the Bronx. And of course, on Fifth Avenue between 56th and 57th Street, which is right outside Trump Tower. So we asked for access as well to paint because no one is above the law. And we, we, uh, we thought we might be able to do it between 81st and 83rd Street. So a little bit uptown there. So we gave the mayor three days to respond. In the case of D.C., we gave them three days. We waited three weeks. And as with D.C. in New York, we are willing to enforce our rights in court if necessary. If necessary. You know, I, and this kind of goes to a broader issue. Our rule of law is under attack. We are facing a communist revolution. We have leftist politicians endorsing one side of the fight. I mean, the Black Lives Matter phraseology is, is, is not designed to promote or protect black lives. It's designed to incite racial division. 
It suggests that police specifically target blacks because they're blacks. It suggests that blacks are victimized by system, systemic racism. It attacks the fundamental basis of the American system. The Black Lives Matter movement, the official organized structure, the global foundation, whatever it's being called now, they're Marxists. They say they're Marxists. They're communists. Those Seattle protesters, it's a, communi it's a communist insurrection we're facing. I mean, you think it was burning, if about burning and, and taking down Confederate statues? No, they're assaulting George Washington statues. They're tearing down the statue of a saint in California. Christopher Columbus, George Washington, they're attacking now Mount Rushmore. If the New York Times quoting some radical activist who thinks whose goal, whose organization's goal is to quote decolonize the United States. What does that mean? It means end a country. And we have Republicans, senators who I generally like, Senator Johnson and Langford. We're proposing to remove the Columbus Day holiday in exchange for adding this Juneteenth anniversary as a federal holiday. I, for, I for one, have no problem whatsoever in having a federal holiday celebrating the end of slavery, whether it be Juneteenth. I think, I think historically speaking, a better date would be the uh, the. The, the anniversary of the passage of the 13th Amendment, which was, I think, was in December. I, 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 no problem. It's, it's something to be celebrated. It is. But by ending Columbus Day as a federal holiday, or at least a paid federal holiday, they're pretending it's about money. Do you think it's about money? Of course it's not about money. Of course it's not about money. The only activity in Congress is about attacking the police with regulations. I mean, the president has been at least pushing and leading on this issue much more aggressively than Congress, highlighting about through an executive order, the enforcement of the uh, law protecting uh, monuments from being desecrated and attacked. 10 years in jail, potentially, a lot of people are going to face. Hundreds have been arrested. But it's a broader issue than just attacking monuments. They're trying to destroy our republic. It's a revolution. It's an insurrection. And we have to treat it as such. So we do what we can to highlight the rule of law and the failure to apply it equally in the District of Columbia and in New York. But let's be clear, our leaders need to step up because these revolutionaries, these insurrectionists won't succeed, will not succeed if our government, for the people and by the people, put it down. These aren't, this isn't a protest. This is a revolution. So... Um, well, you know, it is Independence Day. So I love Independence Day because it, it celebrates the founding of the United States, which is the greatest nation in the history of the world in terms of freedom, liberty, the elevation of, of humankind. Our system of government is, is despite its failures, uh, is the best place where I think uh, currently where liberty can prosper. Liberty property understood, of course, under law, under law. And uh, what's the con what's the Constitution? What's the, what's the beginning of the, the preamble to the Constitution? We, the people, in order to establish a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, 
to ordain, uh, promote the common defense, promote the general welfare, and ensure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and the posterity to ordain and establish this Constitution of the United States of America. Secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity. What are we doing to secure the blessings of liberty for ourselves and our posterity? Our liberties are under attack with these coronavirus shutdowns, dishonest shutdowns, needless shutdowns. Our republic's under attack from the left on the streets and in the halls of justice and in the halls of Congress. I'm proud to say Judicial Watch is doing a lot. And I think you know that. So one of the things the left hates is memory. They hate history. They, they smear America by just attacking our nation's founding. If you want to know what a real revolution for liberty is about, you need to read our founding documents. And to that end, I am going to take the time to read the Declaration of Independence to you. Read along. Go ahead and find it somewhere and read along. In Congress, July 4th, 1776, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes, and accordingly all experience have shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer while, evens are, while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed to, to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces a design that reduced them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security, such has been the patient sufferance of these colonies, and such now is necessity which constrains them to alter their former systems of government. The history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world. He, hath he has refused his assent to laws, the most wholesome and necessary for the public good. He has forbidden his government to pass laws of immediate and pressing importance, unless suspended in their operation till his absent shall till his assent shall be attained, and when so suspended he has utterly neglected to attend to them. He has refused to pass other laws to the to the to the accommodation of large districts of people unless those people would would relinquish the right of representation in the legislature, a right inestimable to them and to and formidable to tyrants only. He has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant from the depository of their public records for the sole purpose of fatiguing them into compliance with his measures. He has dissolved representative houses uh, repeatedly for opposing with manly firmness his invasion on the rights of the people. He has refused for a long time after such dissolutions to cause others to be elected whereby the legislative powers incapable of annihilation have returned to the people at large for their exercise, the state remaining in the meantime exposed to all the dangers of invasion from without and convulsions within. He has endeavored to, he has endeavored to prevent the population of these states for that purpose obstructing the laws for 
naturalization of foreigners, refusing to pass others to encourage their migrations hither, and raising the conditions of new appropriation of lands. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judiciary powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. He has erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He's affected to render the military independent of and superior to the civil power. He has combined with others to subject us to jurisdiction, to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our constitution and unacknowledged by our laws, giving his assent to their acts of pretended legislation for quartering large bodies of troops, of armed troops among us, for protecting them by a mock trial from punishment of, for any murders which they should commit on the inhabitants of these states for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world, for imposing taxes on us without our consent, for depriving us in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury, for transporting us beyond the seas, beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses, for abolishing the free system of English laws in a neighboring province, thereby establishing therein an arbitrary government and enlarging its boundaries so as to render it at once an example and fit instrument for introducing the same absolute rule into these colonies, for taking away our charters, abolishing our most, valuable law, our most valuable laws, and altering fundamentally the forms of our governments, for suspending our own legislature and declaring themselves invested with powers to legislate for us in all cases whatsoever. He has abdicated government here by declaring us out of his protection and waging war against us. He has plundered on our, our seas, ravaged our coasts, burnt our towns, and destroyed the lives of our people. He is at time transporting large armies of foreign mercenaries to complete the works of death, desolation, and tyranny already begun with circumstances of cruelty and perfidy, scarcely paralleled in the most barbarous ages and totally unworthy the head of a civilized nation. He has constrained our fellow citizens taken captive on the high seas to bear arms against their country to become the executioners of their friends and brethren or to fall themselves by their heads, by their hands. He has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring, out the, bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. In every stage, of these oppressions, we have petitioned for redress. In the most humble terms, our repeated petitions have been answered only by repeated injury. A prince whose character is thus marked by every act which may define a tyrant is unfit to be the ruler of the people, of a free people. Nor have we been wanting in attentions to our Brit British brethren. We have warned them from time to time of attempts by their legislature to extend an unwarranted jurisdiction over us. We reminded them of the circumstances of our immigration and settlement here. We've appealed to their native justice. We've appealed to their native justice and magnanimity, and we have conjured them by the ties of our common kindred to disavow those usurpations, which would inevitably interrupt our connections and correspondence. They too have been deaf to the voice of justice and of consanguinity, and we should must therefore acquiesce in the necessity which denounces our separation, hold them as we hold the rest of mankind, enemies in war, in peace, friends. We therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appearing to the Supreme Judge of the world, appealing to the Supreme Court, excuse me, we therefore, the representatives of the United States of America and General Congress assembled, appealing to the Supreme Judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions due in the name and by the authority of the good people of these colonies, solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved, and that as a free and independent, that as free as independent states, they shall have powers to levy war, conclude peace, 
contract alliances, establish commerce, and do all the other acts and do all other acts and things which independent states may have right may have right do. And for the support of this declaration with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we, mu we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. For Georgia, Button, Gwinnett, Lyman Hall, George Walton. For North Carolina, William Hooper, Joseph Hughes, John Penn. For South Carolina, Edward Rutledge, Thomas Hayward Jr., Thomas Lynch Jr., Arthur Middleton. For Massachusetts, John Hancock. For Maryland, Samuel Chase, William Packer, Thomas Stone, Charles Carroll of Carrollton. Virginia, George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, Thomas Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, Carter Braxton. For Pennsylvania, Robert Morris, Benjamin Rush, Benjamin Franklin, John Morton, J George Clymer, James Smith, George Taylor, James Wilson, and George Ross. For Delaware, Caesar Rodney, George Reed, and Thomas McKean. For New York, William Floyd, Phil Livingston, Francis Lewis, and Lewis Morris. For New Jersey, Richard Stockton, John Witherspoon, Francis Hops Hop Hopkinson, John Hart, and Abraham Clark. For New Hampshire, Josiah, Josiah Bartlett and w William Whipple. For Massachusetts, Samuel, I Samuel Adams, John Adams, Robert Treat Payne, Elbridge Jerry. Rhode Island, Stephen Hopkins and William Ellery. And for Connecticut, Roger Sherman, Samuel Huntington, William Williams, Oliver Wolcott, and for New Hampshire, Matthew Thornton. Those are our founders, or some of them. Remember, that document was designed to be read out loud. So, you know, as we celebrate Independence Day, I want you to think and place yourself in the shoes of those men who risked it all to declare independence and provide the blessings of liberty to themselves and our posterity. Would you have been able to do it? I hope so. I trust a lot of you would be. So I wish you a happy Independence Day and God bless this United States of America. Have a great week, and I'll see you next time on the Judicial Watch Weekly Update.